What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. What's up? I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we've got 37 new books to talk about. Jesus, guy! It's fine. We don't have Justin here this week, so we're not going to get chatty about it. We're going to do a thumbs up. <laughs> Thumbs down at the just, just super of, quick move just on, on through this. Just a you know, snap judgment. Don't give people enough information. That's what listen, really... how long does it honestly take them to put together these comic books? Five, ten minutes, something like that. So come that's on, all, dude. That's all the time they deserve. These artists put their blood, sweat, and tears dude, into this thing. All right. You're so absolutely you should, right. You I feel bad respectful. even saying that out loud. Why don't we jump into a big one, Web of Spider? Spider-Man, number one from Marvel, oh. written by Zeb Wells, Cody Ziegler, Steve Fox, Stephanie Phillips, Greg Weissman, and Alex Segura. Art by John Romita Jr., Ele- Eleanor, excuse me, Carlini, Iguara, Ed McGinnis, Eric Gapster, Greg Land, Joey Vasquez, and Salvador LaRocca. This is one of those classic Who's Marvel who? preview issues, giving us a sneak peek at a bunch of stuff that's coming down the pike. And this time, it's all from the world of Spider-Man. So we're getting a little look at Peter Parker, Miles Morales, Gwen Stacy, a.k.a. Ghost Spider. But we're also getting Chasm and Kane and Spider-Man 2099, a bunch of others. Lots of stuff going on here in this issue. Pete, I know you've been a bit back and forth about Spider-Man stuff. How did you feel about this? Well, this is 55 pages of just kind of action-packed ideas, cameos, like uh, Justin mentioned earlier. This is kind of like a, uh, hey, let's try a bunch of stuff, see what people like, and then maybe kind of go from there. I think this is a very ambitious and very, very kind of cool to lay out of like, they, hey, this is what we're thinking. You know what I mean? It's almost like we're seeing their kind of brainstorming board where they have all these kind of ideas and characters. Well, let me ask you this. Of the stuff that you saw in this issue, because to your mm-hmm. point, all of this is about get excited for the next year of Spider-Man yeah. storytelling. What got you excited? What of these, so most of them are two pages long, maybe four yeah. pages. What got you psyched in particular? I mean, it was kind of hilarious because it was like, do you remember this Spider-Man? How about this Spider-Man? You know, and they were just kind of like, you're just kind of doing Spidey poses and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So it was kind of funny to be like, oh, yeah, (laughs) all right. Oh, I forgot about this guy. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if. Because it was so quick and it w- they were just kind of like this, 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 this. It was hard to get like too kind of blown away. But I don't know. It was just kind of cool to see uh, a bunch of different characters and kind of different things. The weird kind of gremlin goblin was mm-hmm. kind of, I, I guess, most interesting to me. Um, so and that- we're going to probably see the least of him. Out of any of the characters. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw out there, I generally like this issue. I thought there were, there's good writers on here. There's good artists. Yeah, great the artists. The least exciting to me was the Zeb Wells, John Romita Jr. thing that kicked it off with Peter Parker. But that's only because they just delivered more. It was like reiterating what we already saw in Gang War. So I read this and I was yeah. like, yeah, I like th- I like what they were doing there. I will continue to read this. But for somebody yeah. who has no idea and didn't read Gang War, I could see how that was a good teaser. The ones that got me excited, I thought the stuff with Gwen Stacy with a spider ghost or ghost spider, excuse me, were intriguing. I'm very curious to see what's going to happen with her. The chasm stuff... I've been very iffy about all the Ben Riley stuff, but the idea, and this is a spoiler for the issue, that Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen, is like, hey, you know how we imprisoned him? That was stupid. Just let him go. <laughs> was <laughs> very fun. I'm curious to see what happens with him next and yeah. what he does to Peter and the rest of the characters. I'm a little less into the spider society stuff, honestly, and the whole like spider verse stuff. I feel like we've done a little too much of that. But at the same time, I was like Alex Segura's stuff, and I'm curious yeah. to see what happens next. So there you He's go. He's a great writer. 
Wonder Woman, number seven from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Gil and March. This is the diametric opposite of the last issue, where we got a ton of stuff from the last issue. And this is very hyper-focused on one thing. It's actually jumping back before or immediately after Wonder Woman number five. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting which. Wonder Woman and Superman take a little break. And we go it's to the biggest together, you know? mall in the universe, try to get a present for Batman Love the idea of this issue. Weird continuity on the timing of it, uh, I would say, just in terms of like, this is an issue that comes after our big last issue, but actually before the issue after that and all of this stuff. But in terms of like digging into the character of Wonder Woman, digging into the character of Superman, putting them in fun situations... This is a really lovely, wonderful comic book that has a fun time with it. It feels mildly similar to, I'm forgetting which issue of Batman it was, but the one where Catwoman and Batman and Superman and Lois Lane go on a double date and they all see yeah. costumes and stuff. Reminded me of that pleasantly. So I enjoyed this quite a bit. What about you, Pete? Yeah, this almost reminded me a little bit of an X-Men issue because they go to the mall and they go shopping. And <laughs> uh, I mean, I was a little like, wow, Superman. When he's hitting the dad jokes pretty hard in this. Gotta love it. They're good. Uh, They're good little dad eye jokes. Rolling, They're little good. eye rolling on this. Uh, but. This is also super sweet. Like the fact that the two of them are together and they're thinking about Batman and they're going to get Batman a present. I thought that was just like, I, I don't know. And even Superman being like, yeah, we're going to crush your coal into a diamond, right? Like, like I got to do that, you know? So it was just, uh, I I really, I, at first I was rolling my eyes, but, you know, kind of like a dad situation where at first you're like, come on, dad. But then they get you in the field. So you're like, mm -hmm. oh, man, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I thought this was uh, a pleasant surprise. At first I was like, oh, man, this is just going to be a crazy mall issue where they're going to go into Spencer's gifts and oh, it's going to all go down. Uh, but, yeah, I, uh, I pleasantly surprised great art. Uh, yeah, get you in the feels a little bit. Yeah, I also thought it was ultimately a very smart decision to set this in the current continuity. I was expecting it was going to go way back, but tying it into Wonder Woman having a conversation with Superman, or at least him trying to have a conversation with her about the fact that Amazons have been banned from the United States, gave it a really a good emotional heft throughout the issue. So great stuff. Gil March drawing a very poofy cape for Superman. <laughs> like, it's very poofy behind his head. Looks yeah, like a strife little... cape or something like that. Oh, but... wow. Yeah. There you go. Man's Best, number one for Boob Studios, written by Portsack Pinnishot, art by Jesse Lonergan. We saw a ash can of this a couple of weeks back. Now we're seeing it in yeah, color, the full issue. If I remember correctly, our big reaction from the ash can was, what? No, I want to see more. Now we've seen more of this story of a bunch of animals in space, very We Three inspired. Animals in space. Sorry. What'd you think, Pete? You love animals. I do. This was awesome. I thought this was really cool. Uh, you know, it's just a bunch of furry friends teaming up to take on some evil clangers. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I love this. I thought it was great art, great, great world building. Just a solid first issue of setting things up getting you excited for more uh yeah i just uh i thought that the just the 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 talk between them was kind of cool and interesting and yeah i was just kind of impressed uh emotionally uh how deep it was even it was, even though it was just animals so yeah uh fun Jesse Lonergan, the artist, nails exactly what you need to nail here, which is these animals are absolutely adorable. From mm -hmm. the writing perspective, we get to see the animals talking, but the humans not hearing it. And I kind of love that as a device. I'm all in on this book. He, Portzak, uh, Pitcher shot, I mispronounced his name earlier, and probably just now, it, it is pretty <laughs> open about the fact that it's like homeward bound in space. That's exactly what it is. You got me. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. All, let's do it. Let's go. X-Men Forever, number one Forever. for Marvel. Forever. 
Written by Kieran Gillen, art by Luca Bureska. This is Kieran Gillen filling in the gaps between Immortal X-Men and what's currently going on in Rise of the Powers of X. And that's exactly what it feels like. I am very curious to hear what you think of this, Pete, just because as somebody who is very into what Kieran Gillen is doing on X-Men, very into this current era of X-Men, this is a little bit like... I don't know. I was trying to think how to characterize it, but it's like good homework where you're like, oh, okay, that's why that's happening. That's why Salve. Doug had a you... sinister diamond no. on his forehead. Oh, that's how Mother Righteous got there. No. Now I understand these things. So I, there's no real emotional story here, but it was very much, I was like, this is an essential read Salve. for me that I'm enjoying. You... I have to imagine you hated this. You can't put two words together like good and homework there's no <laughs> such thing as good homework you asshole i hated you in school you i we didn't know each other but i would have hated you in can school. i tell you, you what like, i used to do in elementary can we get school some more homework can i tell you what this is 100 percent true in elementary school whenever we get a new textbook i would immediately run home take it out of my backpack throw it on the couch wouldn't even go to my room i'd be on the couch in the living room and i'd read the entire textbook from front to back before what? I did anything else. Because I what? loved it. I loved oh, it. My. Who are you? It's true. Oh my God. Hey, Dad, can I go to the mailbox and read the bills? <laughs> Who the fuck are you? You fucking psychopath. Well, oh this is uh, clearly right in my wheelhouse, this guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, this was not fun. I wrote down, okay, what do we learn? A uh, lot of infighting. Um, uh, Sinister birthed himself out of a cocoon, and uh, Mar Maria uh, Mora had a past. Hey, Mystique was there. Uh, great art. I have no idea what the fuck this is or what this means or this is... what the fuck is going on. I will uh, say I'm not, this I'm is definitely not having fun, but I can't wait for us to get past it. This is, I'm sure, incomprehensible for anybody who hasn't been nonstop reading X-Men comic books for the past couple of years. If you have, it is essential in terms of filling in those gaps there of things they've been skipping over because a lot of it has been jumping around in time, particularly if you've been reading Rise of the Powers of X and Immortal X-Men and Sins of Sinister. In terms of that, I loved it. Loved the Destiny Mystique stuff. That is the romance for the ages that we've got in this current era of X-Men. But I don't know. Also, I forgive you if you miss it. It's fine. <laughs> Batman Superman World's Finest, number 25 from DC Comics, written by Mark Wade, art by Steve Pugh and Dan Mora. <laughs> we are getting to see the first meeting between Lex Luthor and the Joker as they team up to get a mystical artifact. Love the story. Love the Steve Pugh art. Great to see him on something that's like <clears throat> kind of serious yet funny at the same time. He's kind of been like the funny guy paired up with Mark Russell, but this takes it a little more seriously. I thought this was a great issue. I had a blast. Yeah, uh, great covers. Uh, fun uh, kind of first story here with Joker and Lex Luthor team up and then Spoiler, surprise, surprise, the Joker is going to backstab you. Um, and then the second story with Mixelplek and the fun cameo, uh, again, spoilers by Bat and Might there. Uh, some great, amazing stuff. Um, I thought this was a lot of fun. I, I feel like, I know you just said a lot of fun. I feel like you're being a little dismissive. I will say... Nobody gets the DC characters. He does the same thing with the Marvel characters, but nobody gets these characters like Mark Wayne. Like he just nails, drills down on like, this is your essential Lex Luthor. This is your essential Joker. Let's go from there. Like he's just, and I'm not saying anything new, but he's just an absolute master of this stuff at this point. So it's great to read. Dawn Runner, number one from Dark Horse Dawn Comics, Runner. written by Ram V, art by Evan Cagle. This takes place in a world where giant monsters have invaded an area. They've been walled off. And what do we do to take down the giant monsters? Oh, <clears throat> you know it's giant mechs. There's a new generation giant mech, and that is coming to a monster. Some weird stuff happens here at the same time. This is not 
straightforward Pacific Rim. This is not just Attack on Titan or anything like that. There's more stuff going on here. I was very intrigued by this. But if you are a fan of things like that and anime and manga in particular, I think you're going to really enjoy this issue. Yeah, this is epic. I mean, it, it's awesome. It's huge giant monsters fighting giant mech robots. Uh, the art is just so awesome in creating these worlds and these monsters and mech stuff. I mean, great characters. Uh, it takes a twist at the end there that kind of pulled me out of a little mm -hmm. bit. Um you know, I was having a great time with all the battles, but then I was like, "Did wait, did that uh, robot get hit by that giant skull monster and then turn into a dude later in the war? So I was a little kind of like, I'll have to tune in next time to figure out what's going on. But um, yeah, interesting little twist towards the end there. I thought I knew what I was getting into, but then Ram V was like, nah. Uh, I'll tell you, I mean, I think and I mean this not dismissively at all, I think this points to the essential difference to how you interact with comics versus me. The entire time I was like, this is pretty straightforward. And then we got to the end there with that twist you're talking about. I was like, okay, here we go. Give me more of this. <laughs> it feels... The opposite of how I was reading. I was like, no. oh, I can get this. I love this. I understand. What... Hey, what happened? Yeah. Uh, so we're getting a little bit of a blend of identities and exactly who is who. I have some theories that maybe I'll share as we continue to read this book. But as is, it starts to feel a little Matt Kinty to me mm. at the end there in terms of like breaking the that's format a, of what we have going on. Compliment. Matt Kent does great 100%. stuff. 100%. I... And I really like that. I thought it was very interesting. I'm very excited to follow the series. It also has a killer title page. I'd give a shout oh, out. Oh yeah. Where it feels it feels like I know we say this a lot, and we're a comic book podcast, but it feels like the beginning of a movie. We get this narration about everything that's going on, and then it cuts to the title, and it it kicks ass. Like it, it does. This is a very cool comic book and i don't say that lightly definitely pick this one up star wars visions takashi okazaki number one from marvel by takashi okazaki this is following up on one of the shorts that he did over in star wars visions that took the star wars world and put it into the ronin slash samurai world so we're getting a lot of that influence there pete i have to imagine you love this yeah, this was great. I mean, the art was the real hero here. I mean, this is just uh, kind of fantastic art, uh, kind of an old Ronin samurai story. The cover, uh, I was a little disappointed because it gives away this kind of moment that's earned a little bit in the comic. But when you see the cover, you're kind of like, R2 with a hat? What? <laughs> but it's a little bit more, you get the story behind it in the comic, so it doesn't feel so ridiculous. Um, so that part was a little weird, but I mean, just the use of like the blues and the colors and all the different kind of stuff to kind of, uh, uh, set the tone, which was really cool. Um, uh, also there was this like moment when the droid turned and said, Poppy. And I was just like, ah, I don't know about that. You know what I mean? Like that was a little weird how the droid said, Poppy. You were like uh, a little turned on. Like, no, I just, I Poppy. I, I just feel like that. Why is the droid all of a sudden speaking Spanish? Uh, it just, you know, I, you know, there's sound effects, there's noises that droids mm -hmm. make, and I know it's beeping noises, but the poppy was like at a weird moment. So I was kind of like, uh, that's kind of crazy. I love that this Star Wars Visions project exists both in the Agreed. animation as well as Marvel Comics just great to see different voices and focuses on the star wars universe honestly it's something that i've wanted for decades at this point so Ooh. it's really lovely it's to see time. it finally happening very it's happy time domna here <laughs> it is uh and here is my time up here justice league versus godzilla versus Kong number six Come for out! dc comics 
Written by Brian Bucciolato, art by Christian Duce. This is surprisingly the, the second to last issue of this comic book, which is taking the MonsterVerse and pitting it against the DC Universe. Lots of stuff going down in this issue as the Justice League has figured out kind of where the monsters have come from. They've trapped Godzilla on the bottom of the ocean. King Kong is missing. Um, there's a bunch of monsters that are attacking Metropolis, uh, led by Lex Luthor, who has put his brain into Mecha Godzilla. So we're really building it up to it here. My qualm with this book right now. Oh, how dare you! I still, I know it's coming in the last issue, but like, I just want it to get, I want wild moments in every issue and we're not quite getting that. Do you, How you think we're getting that? Fucking dare you. Yes, we're getting that. <laughs> oh Are you God. fucking serious right now? This is not to overuse a term here, but this is epic. I mean, this is giant monsters fight each other. There's a giant Batman robot. Green Lantern creates its own kind of mech monster. Beast Boy Kong. I mean, this is just huge and amazing. Uh, and then we get this kind of teaser for the last issue. Oh, it's going to be Superman versus Godzilla. Oh, man, I just, uh, I, I'm very excited. I love all these issues. Just the, the the fact that we're getting kind of like real storylines is impressive because I, you know, part of me just wants to have kind of like a sandbox smash fest where it's just like, well, who versus who? But uh, yeah, I'm really impressed with the storylines that we're getting in this giant epic battle. Uh, but the art is doing uh, it so much justice. This is a ton of fun. There's a thing that happens in the next issue that they've already put out there that I'm hesitant to mention because I don't, don't want to spoil ruin it, it for you. Do not. But I will mention there is a character what? that like no, 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 dies in this issue that I was like, what are you doing? It leads directly into an event of the Nash issue, though, that I think Pete is going to make you maybe lose your mind. We'll see what happens. I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know if I, I, I know what you're talking about, and I hope it's not what you think is going to happen. Wait, what do you think? Do you want to throw out a prediction? And I won't say anything. No, I don't. I don't want to say it. Say it. No, say I don't. It. I don't want to say speculate. it. Say no, it. No, no, I won't. <laughs> no, I won't. All right. Well, anyway, um, fun stuff. I wanted to go a little harder. Pete doesn't think it goes hard enough. Pop's Chocolate Shop of Horrors, Fresh Meat, number one from Archie Comics, written by Amy Chase, Ryan Katie, and Jordan Morris. Art by Frederico Sabatini, Chris Panda, and Liana Kangas. We are getting a bunch of short horror stories set in the DC Universe, uh, not DC Universe, excuse me, Archie Comics Universe. <laughs> there we my go. My brains. Archie Comics Universe all around Pop's Chocolate Shop as the devil comes to town. That's and, right. And uh, we get a couple of short stories around that. I had a delightful time reading this issue. I thought these stories were very fun, very gruesome in exactly the way that you want out of this sort of thing. And very funny at the same time. I think occasionally these anthologies have been like a little quick, like we, they've needed a little more space to tell their stories. But this one, I think all three teams hit it exactly right. So definitely one of the top tier horror anthology books from Archie Comics so far. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people when Riverdale ended were like, man, I really wish we got more episodes with the Goathead Devil. And what's nice about the comics is now those things uh, can happen, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Goathead Devil shows up to your town, you know, they're going to go right to the Pops' uh, restaurant. When the Goathead Devil shows up to your town, gonna go right to Pops. <laughs> oh boy, fun. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is just kind of madness ensuing in such a fun way of, uh, you know, kind of putting a little little uh, uh, fun haunting into Riverdale and making things fucked up and, and only uh, in ways that, uh, you know, is kind of twisted in a fun kind of horror tales type of thing, you know, tales from the crypt style. 
but yeah, I just I think the art was great. I think the kind of premise was clear and well executed, and uh, it was kind of nice to see. Uh, you know, because Archie has done a lot of great horror stories, and they really do a good job of that, and good good the right people on these projects. So it's impressive to see him uh, go to work. Star Wars Django Fett, number one from Marvel, written by Ethan Sachs, art by Luke Ross. This is a brand new title focusing on everybody's second favorite Fett character yeah. in the Star Wars universe, taking it back in time and pitting him against Aura Singh. Ooh. Yeah, this was a ton of fun. Uh, I also really love the kind of title page before this started. I love the coloring and stuff on it. Set a great tone. Uh, the action, great characters, love the pace of this. I cannot wait for the next issue. I think they did just a great job of kind of like setting up uh, Bounty Hunter. This is how it worked. This is how things are going to go. Classic. It felt like an episode of Mandalorian. Yeah, it's it's fine. I think I would love Django Fett at some point to say that's how you get ahead in this universe because like that would wow. be like a funny funny joke for the future because he gets decapitated. No, yeah. That was uh... Did you know that? You know what's really great about uh, humor up? is when you I got to explain the punchline and yeah, it really yeah. helps. Oh, okay. I, I, thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, man. Pete, uh, for anybody who's listening, is my comedy coach. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think this is a fun use of Jenga. I think that also, like, uh, I'd like to see what makes Jenga fad different. You know, like yeah. different things happen. I, I think that was the thing that I was feeling through this issue because he's doing cool, but Boba I feel like we'll things. There. But like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's how right. we know. You know, uh, the bounty hunter world. So, like, I'm hoping we start there, but then kind of get to some more unique stuff. April special for number one from DC Comics, written by John Lehman, Joshua Hell Fialkov, and Gene Lun Yang. Art by Carl Mostert, Phil Hester, and Bernard Chang. This is another in the expertly titled anthology special dc's killing this dude absolutely just uh, honestly killing like, these whoever, fun one shot things that just like have whoever's naming these i don't know if they give a pulitzer prize for that sort of thing but they should <laughs> they i don't know about that it. they should get something to raise presidential Lord. medal of freedom that's what i don't I'm know thinking. i think that's maybe a little too much uh but this is just you the title sets you up for fun and if you're not looking at that going like oh i know what this is i think this would be enjoyable yeah don't pick it up because this is exactly what is implied uh this is just a lot of amazing fun stories that revolve around the apes in the dc world and uh uh, monkeys and chimpanzees and all that kind of different stuff but this is just well executed idea I loved all these stories. Uh, I I just uh, I I was just having a blast. The JLA part where he was like the Jungle League of America. I loved it. It just, I just loved it. This book keeps layering on the Simeon characters one after other. Like, oh, they got all of them. Oh no, I forgot <laughs> about that one. There's that yeah. one now, it, and it's yeah. great. The other thing that's great about it that it's very different from the other anthologies that DC has done is all of the stories intertwine and continue off of each other, which I was really impressed by, given that there's different authors. So, yeah. it's not just. Here's a monkey. Here's another yeah. monkey. Here's a chimpanzee. Here's a gorilla, etc. It's they start off with something and then they follow it through nicely with different tones and different stories. There's emotional heft to it at the same time. As yeah, they're just jokes. not chasing their tails. There's like stuff going on. You know, what I, I mean? get it. I it's wild to me that you didn't say the art is bananas good, but. It is. Oh, I blew it. You did. Turn in well, your gun and your badge, Pete. Oh, that's it. Yeah, it's been a heck of a ride. I uh, apologize to everybody, and uh, I'm hanging it up. 
Number anyway, two. great special. Definitely pick that up. The Infernals, number two from Image Comics, written by Noah Gardner and Ryan Parrott, art by John G. Pearson and Lola Bonato. This is following three, not kids, they're adults now, but they are the three children of the man who is supposed to be the Antichrist. That didn't really pan out, and it's not really panning out for them either. But they're trying to consolidate power, and it's not going particularly well in this issue. We talked about the first one being like succession goes to hell. I don't know if that's exactly what this issue is, but it's very fun. I had a really good time reading this. What about you, Pete? Uh, yeah, this is this is awesome. Um, it's you know, there's a lot going on here. You know, I mean, you know, we got a guy dying, and he's not going to pass it along to his firstborn son, which is just a slap in the face. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you're the son, you're thinking like, oh, I got this in the bag, and he's totally. like, nah. But I'm surprised he didn't turn around and be like, yo, you raised me, Dad. If you don't like me, like, why didn't you say something along the way? I could have gotten better. I could have grown. I could have learned. Now we're this is at feeling the end. very and real, Pete. What? Are you drawing on some real emotions here? Uh, As a firstborn son yourself? No. no. Uh, that's weird that you would Family point that out. Family uh, that's really, uh, anyways, uh, power struggle, uh, amazing art, uh, really some great panels. Uh, they did a great job of showing rage, uh, through kind of, uh, you know, very still panel work and, uh, it's impressive. I, uh, as someone who appreciates, uh, rage was, uh, was happy with the portrayal. Um, yeah, a little tip of the hat, uh, to the art there. Uh, this was great. Really good creative book that doesn't shy away from the danger, the grossness, or the humor at the same time. Definitely pick it up. Captain Marvel, number six from Marvel, written by yeah. Alyssa Wong, art by Rari Coleman. In this issue, Captain Marvel is trying to trap the Undone, is I believe the name of the villain character who has been plaguing her and her new superpowered thief that is tied to her with the Nega Bands. They try to pull one over on her. It doesn't go particularly well in this issue. I'm really digging this series. I really like how it's skirting along Captain Marvel continuity without making it impenetrable to new readers at the same time. Great stuff, and I really like the art as well. It's a little cartoony without going too far in that direction. Good stuff. Yeah, I agree. The art has a cool, like, she revibe to it. Uh, yeah, this is an act, action packed ish. Uh, love the art. Uh, love the whole kind of like Nega Bands uh, thing. Like, uh, you know, people love their Nega Bands. You know what I mean? Uh, this this continues to rock. I'm enjoying Cap Captain Marvel right now. Uh, more of this, please. And just as a note, if you're a fan of Hulkling and Wiccan, they play big in oh, this issue, yeah. so very fun as well. Yeah, Batman good. 89 Echoes, number two from DC Comics, written by Sam Hamm, art by Joe Canones. Batman is missing, and villains are starting to build in Gotham City. That includes Madonna, who is playing Harley Quinn, as well as unidentified actor as Scarecrow. Meanwhile, the other characters are trying to figure out where Bruce Wayne is and when potentially he's coming back. I really like the series a lot, way more than I thought I would, given it's a sequel to a movie series that, I don't know, there's no reason for it to exist. But as is, particularly with Michael Keaton's Batman even off screen, I'm really intrigued by the directions they're taking all of these characters. What about you, Pete? Yeah, I mean, uh, first off, I feel like you're insulting uh, Michael Keaton's Batman, which I don't appreciate. I mean, that was a epic Batman that, uh, man, I'm more overusing like, the word like epic today. Bad man. Uh, hey, fuck you, man. All right. That Michael Keaton is Batman continues to be Batman and they can't let go of it so much that now we've got an echo More of, like uh, uh cycle beaten. Oh wow. That took way too long. Uh, dude, you I don't know. breathe can that we, out. Can we rewind? Can we rewind <laughs> Shake that out a little bit. That yeah, anyways. Make any sense. 
uh great covers love the art uh i i like what's being set up and harley quinn is just so much fun in this uh yeah it's a little weird where um the the couple of characters like they kind of look like uh michael keaton in different angles and stuff like that so that was a little kind of like throwing me uh but other than that just uh this is a blast and it's fun to revisit um some might say one of the best batmans mm. Mm. one of the best that is a bold statement <laughs> Easily one of the top ten actors who have ever played Batman. Uh, in go fuck action. yourself. I didn't say that. Yeah. Lilo and Stitch, number two from Dynamite, written by Greg Pak, art by yeah, Greg Julia Gia Camino. In this issue, uh, Stitch is lost at a convention. Comic convention? Uh, fantasy convention? Whatever it is, it's a convention. He's wandering around there while Lilo and family are looking for them. This comic continues to be absolutely adorable. I think Greg Pak and company are completely nailing what the movie is like in new form. So I'm very much enjoying this. What about you, Pete? Hell yeah, I'm enjoying the crap out of this. And I can't wait for Zelvin to book Greg Pak back on our show so we can talk about great projects like this. This is, I was surprised how hard this hit me in the feels. You know, I mean... Uh, you know, this is kind of heartbreaking. Stitch kind of, you know, spoilers, but it's like, fine, I'll just live in Australia by myself so everyone I, I love will be safe. Well, and, I was oh, going to say, the thing that happens to this issue is that Stitch ends up at this convention and has to pretend to be a plushy doll. That happened yeah. to you, right, Pete? Like, that's something that you went through emotionally, so... <sighs> Yeah, they based uh, what happened in E.T. off my life. Um, oh my yeah, it was uh, really triggering. And when you me. say that, that's eating Reese's Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, I eat so many of them, my fingers glow. Uh, anyways, <laughs> I, I think it's one of those things where, uh, like, even the evil robot sharks are cute and adorable, and they want to get caricatures done of themselves and stuff like that at the con. And it, this is... It, it just it's it's cuter and more fun loving than it has any business being but it's just uh it done in such a cool fun way that also still feels like the lilo and stitch you know from the movies and disney and all that kind of stuff so yeah uh this is just such a great job of taking a world and blowing it out the Invincible Iron Man, number 16, from Marvel, written by Jerry Dugan, art by Chris Lee. The end uh, of the it's last Duggan. issue. It's, it's, it's Duggan. Not, uh, oh, you're right. Oh, my yeah. good. Yeah, let's. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. Sorry, Jerry, for mispronouncing your name for yeah, years. Yeah, and then and sorry for running with that mispronunciation. Yeah. The hard. Dugs. The Dugs. Yeah. Can yeah. I say, he said that he was going to be writing some sort of video game, something or other, on the show, and I really wanted to say Dig Dug, but then I was oh like... Oh my god, dude, if you would have said that, I would have fucking it lost didn't, it. It didn't work. I, the then I wouldn't have been able to, like, face him for the rest of the interview. <laughs> I would have been laughing so hard at <laughs> some of the dumbest... Oh my god. Anyways. Well, anyway... Jerry, Jerry, G yeah. Dugs. <laughs> he, uh, in this he, issue, he, Iron Man has gotten a bunch of armor from space, courtesy of Forge and Riri Williams. It turns out it is a enormous Iron Man suit that he's Sentinel using to attack it. all of the Sentinels who have been created by Orcus in his image. This is also done in the style of uh, Death of Superman. So it's all full page splashes the entire yeah. time. Big action, well planned out throughout. Very impressive issue. Over to you, Pete, for more. God damn it. That's exactly what I have. It's action, uh, wholly action packed ish. I mean, this is just kind of Iron Man fighting himself as well as a giant uh, Sentinel Buster version of himself and crazy kind of ending. And uh, you hope it's going to be okay. I'm, uh, we're going to have to tune in next issue to find out, but it's not looking good for our boy. But yeah, the splash pages, the action is just uh, uh, everything you want out of an Iron Man comic. Overall, I just like how Jerry is... Uh, 
playing around with format lately. Like that's something that he's been doing in all of his books. And it's very impressive to watch a lot of these books end up being samey. And the fact that we're 16 inches into Invincible Iron Man and getting something that rhythmically feels a little different is great. It's impressive. Green Lantern War Journal number seven from DC Comics, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Montos. In this issue, Jon Stewart is trapped and been sent somewhere else by the Radiant Dead, the enemy that he is currently fighting. Meanwhile, back on Earth, the construct he created to help out his mom is going a little rogue. A lot of big emotions and revelations in this issue. You are nodding your head no, and also yes, Pete. What's going on? Yeah, the oh, the Earth stuff gets you, man. But yeah, this is a this is a great issue. Spooky start. Um, also, really love the ending. The kind of villain reveal was just everything you want out of a villain reveal. Very kind of. Uh, uh, monstrous in all the right ways. Yeah, this continues to be solid, uh, but the kid with the grandma just uh, was a bit much. There was a... Uh, it's pretty upsetting, much, and I yeah. will say I appreciate the fact, we talked about this a couple of issues back, that it was messed up that Jon Stewart was like, hey, mom, who is suffering from dementia and all, potentially Alzheimer's, I'm going to make a simulacrum of your dead daughter to amuse you while I'm gone. <laughs> Messed up. They're dealing with that and they're leading into that. And I think that's a they're, release. That's the thing though, is they're leaning into it and, it, and it's like, you're it's like, upsetting. Ah, yeah. well, I, I think there's a world where a lesser writer than Philip Kennedy Johnson would be like, Yep, I did that. Isn't that a nice thing for my mom? The end. And it's not. And he's yeah, leading into the, the creepy, upsetting aspect of it and allowing the other characters to be like, this is not right. You should not be doing this. Another way to word that is it's like he's saying, hey, uh, you know, that fucked up decision I made to kind of uh, on the side there. Yeah, I'm going to fucking lean into that. And we're going to sit in it a little bit more so you really feel that choice I made. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I just I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And it is very true. Uh, but I also wish it would be over soon. Well, if you find this, I'm already dead. Number two from Dark Horse <laughs> Comics, written by Matt Kent, art by Dan McDade. We are following a journalist who was embedded with a army unit fighting a war between, I think, another universe and our universe. She ended up in this other universe and is now trying to survive there. It's dark. It's upsetting. Dan McDade's. Alien landscapes and aliens are fascinating to look at. I love this book. What about you, Pete? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, first off, wow, what a great issue. Uh, cool world, amazing art. Um, the ending was kind of hilarious in such a great way. Uh, I, I really am impressed with this and it, you know, I don't think you've said this before, but I've said this numerous times, but like, has that Matt can kind of feel to it? You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like that really that kind of like, you know, it's so, got that uh, tint of Kent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's his, yeah. That's something I like to say. You don't say that at all, oh, but no. yeah. Yeah. I, uh, um, yeah. Dan is also killing it on art. This is, this is very cool. Resurrection of Magneto, number three from Marvel, written by Al Ewing, art by Luciano Vecchio. Storm has gone to mutant hell to bring Magneto back with her. And in this issue, it all goes down as they literally face their demons to escape from mutant hell. Pete, as you have been down on the X-Men stuff in general, but I think you like the first two issues of this. What did you think about issue number three? Well, this is intense, man. This is a crazy-ish, you know, Magneto and Storm are in this kind of hellish uh, world of battling the Shadow King. And 
and then uh, Storm kind of dies, and then Magneto summons his powers to like save her, but does he? And then she lives, but then uh, but Magneto steps through this kind of portal, so it's like, are they both alive? Or are they both kind of in the same place? Or what's going on? I'm not sure, but man, this is awesome, and uh, uh, I, I I enjoyed it very much. And the art's uh, crazy type bananas. I will say, and this is no spoilers, but X-Men 97 comes out on Disney Plus today. The second episode Wait, is Wait, today? Yes, today as this podcast is airing. Oh, shoot. I was like, man, I got to run. I got an emergency that just came up. <laughs> the second episode is an amazing Storm Magneto episode. So it's wild that this comic is coming out at the same time because there's a lot of parallels. Uh I don't know. I think it's wild. I don't think I don't think it was that heavily coordinated. I think it's oh, coincidence. But dang. regardless, if you like that uh, episode of X-Men 97, check out this issue or vice versa. Justice Society of America number nine from DC Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Mikkel Janine. Huntress, who has come from the future, is trying to redeem a bunch of villains before the time they would normally be redeemed. And by the end of the issue, we get a big reveal of a character who was teased way back in, I, I want to say 2021 or 2022, called the Legionnaire. Um, Pete, what did you think about this one? And then I want to get into spoilers and talk about the end of the issue. Okay, yeah, you should definitely do that. Um, I'm going to politely excuse myself. Uh, I... I don't know, man. This uh, had a creepy kid in it, and then the creepy Legionnaire, and the art is great. I wish this title was coming out more frequently. I'm sure Jeff Johns has moved on to his Ghost Machine imprint, so that's part of the delay that's going on here. But I do like Mikel Janine's art. I do like the thrust of this in terms of, hey, these villains are eventually going to be redeemed. Why don't we try to do it earlier? So I like that quite a bit. The action is very good. But spoilers here, the reveal of the Legionnaire at the end, he's this man in an iron mask, and we find out he's a time traveler with a Legion flight ring. He came back in time, and he takes off his mask. Again, spoilers here. But he reveals that he is Mordru, one of the biggest villains in the DC Universe who has fought... The Justice Society fought the Legion of Superheroes, and he says, I want your help to prevent me from ever becoming the villain you know I'm going to be. It is very similar to me to the Iron Lad is secretly Kang reveal from Young Avengers. What do you think about that, Pete? Because I've been well, struggling a little bit with like, I don't know, that was 20 years ago, so maybe it's okay. <laughs> well, I think that First off, like, dude takes off his helmet and the the mask is creepy, and then the dude's creepy underneath it. I mean, that's double creep factor right there. You know what I mean? He's kind of a handsome dude, I thought. I'm going to disagree with you on that one. <laughs> okay, um, we have different types. Sure, sure. Uh, but also the classic scenario is... I know you know me as an evil person, but listen, I am coming from a different place and I am not evil. So you must trust me so that I won't then do something to completely ruin that trust and reveal myself to be evil this whole time. And I'm just like, I don't, <laughs> I don't buy this at all. So this might uh, the problem is it's lost all momentum because it's come out so slowly over the past couple of years if this was something that was like every month we were reading jsa i think this would be more exciting and interesting but i don't know it's a well put together comic because jeff johns mikhail janine know what they're doing but it's just yes. not having the impact it should i'm curious to revisit this in a couple of years because i love jeff john's jsa run this feels of a piece of that it might read better once we have all 12 issues out so there. you're saying it'll read better in the trade read better in the trade displaced number two from boom studios written by ed price and art by luca casa languida the first issue we were introduced to the denizens of a small town 
that disappeared in a very weird way. Some of them were left. This issue, they're dealing with the ramifications of that. This title is very Lostian, is the best way of putting it. It's sort of like, I don't know if you ever saw the Netflix show, The Society. It's like a reverse situation of that, where there's a bunch of people who are trying to figure out why nobody remembers the town they were from. I'm really into this mystery. I like it a lot. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, this is a, a crazy issue. You know, we have these people who no one remembers them, so they kind of like form their own group, and uh, then they listen to some crazy old guy, but then he forgets. So I guess they're all kind of fucked, but maybe not. Um, also, I really appreciated the uh, cool guy turning into the ghost at the end. This reminds me a little bit, I had to look it up if you heard any clicker clacking, uh, the Nick Spencer, Joe Eisman series, Morning Glories, oh, which was yeah. also like an ongoing mystery series. This reminds me of that tone-wise a little bit, even mm. though it's a very different story. I'm really into this. I love mystery box series like this. Very intrigued by what's going on here, and there's some even weirder things that happen by the end. Cobra Commander number three from Image Comics slash Skybound. On. Written by Joshua Williamson, art by Andrea Milana and Annalisa Leone. In this issue, Cobra Commander has been taken hostage by Dreadnoughts? Yeah. There we go. And is tortured by them. He turns the tables, as Cobra Commander is wont to do. Pete, since yeah. you love this, take us away. Yeah, this is written by uh, Joshua Williamson, and as you know, Justin it really isn't into Joshua Williamson at all. doesn't like any of his works, but I'm a big fan, so uh, this is nice to kind of be able to relish in this yeah, moment if here. If Joshua Williamson is listening to this, this is a bit that Pete does, We All Like You. Oh, wow, man. You outed me in front of Josh, and uh, I feel very, uh, you just, uh, I can't believe you didn't consult with me before you just did that unbelievable anyway yeah guys. and just to check Cobra Ooh, Commander, this on? is a title about uh once you move on from your job keeping your health insurance he's the guy who's in charge of that yeah because cobra we all know does the health insurance yeah, all right cobra so <laughs> yeah so uh, here's the thing I don't know if you don't if you didn't watch GI Joe as a kid if you didn't watch the movie if you're having as much fun as I am on this because I don't know if you know the Zelbatron but we get a huge reveal of the Nemesis Enforcer in this issue and I lost my fucking mind <laughs> so I was like holy shit it's a Nemesis Enforcer but if you don't know who that is you're kind of like Who's this weird guy? Uh, but, oh, man, yeah, this is just a great uh, nostalgia uh, kind of blast. This is just awesome. Um, I, you know, it's fun the way to see Cobra Commander handle the Dreadnoughts. They're torturing him, but he is also torturing them in such a wicked kind of Cobra Commander way that I thought was great. There's a ton of action in this book. I'm just having such a blast with this. The art is fantastic. The writing is fantastic. I don't know if you have to be a G.I. Joe head to enjoy this. I am, and I'm having a blast with this. This is a great package. So... I don't know, I want to say 15 to 20 minutes ago when you said, hey, if you haven't watched G.I. Joe, I don't know how this works for you. I haven't I, been talking for 15 minutes, by the way. I don't know, man, it really felt like that. I <laughs> haven't watched G.I. Joe, and I have no frame of reference. And when we got to that reveal midway through the book, I was like, what's happening? Now? Yeah. What's going on? Who is this guy with the wings? What's happening here? The thing that is working for me about this book, though, is... The horror pacing that Joshua Williamson knows so well and is putting it here along with his artistic collaborators, we get them trying to take off Cobra Commander's mask, so it ends up Can't having this split down the middle. They draw a smiley face on him with uh. blood, and it's a perfect setup for the end of the issue for a creepy push in on Cobra Commander's face as he watches horrible things happening off screen. That's great. 
that's what we got in the first issue. That's what we start to get in the end of this third issue here. I feel like we did delve, for me, a little too much into G.I. Joe land in the second issue of the first half of the third issue. But the horror is awesome. When we had Joshua Williamson on the live show, he talked about... Oh, we should have talked about him. We should have just talked We about talked this. to him about that's what he's going for with this title. And I think he's absolutely crushing that. So I'm having a good time there. Do you, do you remember during our interview, did we talk about how I'm the biggest fan of his? Or I don't, I don't think that came up. Pete, ah, but we can have him on again and again I hope so. bring that up. Okay. Fantastic Four, number 18 from Marvel, written by Ryan North, art by Carlos Gomez. A bunch of stuff is going on at this issue as we find out Franklin Richards' secret. He has all of his powers, his universe-shaking powers, but only has them for one day a year in order to suppress them. Meanwhile, the Fantastic Four is trying to stop a bunch of comets from destroying a town, small town, themselves, and the Earth. I absolutely adore what Ryan North is doing with this Fantastic Four run, the done-in-one stories, the big science concepts, the huge swings that are going on here. We've talked about this before, but he's really trying to channel what Stanley and Jack Kirby did on the original issues of Fantastic Four, and I think he is crushing it. Oh, you're wearing a Kirby shirt. I thought that was Kirby, the little pink ball that sucks up things and adopts their qualities. That's what? No. Uh, yeah, anyways. Kirby, that's, Kirby, Kirby, that's a name you should know. Yeah, anyways, uh, Fantastic Four number 18 here. Yeah, we got the, the godson bragging about his abilities, kind of glowing, floating above uh, his bed. Uh, later, you get this grown dude spying on kids sleeping. Gross. Um, fun action stuff. Saving the world. Love that. Also, weird part where they're just talking to random cops. Uh, and then uh, you got Mr. Fantastic with the bulging eyes. Uh, ridiculous. Absolutely fucking ridiculous. The giant long eyeballs sticking out of his head like he's like they're somehow binoculars because they're longer. What kind of fuck? You're supposed to be a scientist. That doesn't make any fucking sense. That's not how I mean, eyeballs work. It actually does, though, because if you're lengthening out the optic nerves, you're changing uh -huh. the way that light comes into your eyes. So I don't know. It kind of works. Oh, okay, sense. well, I guess I'm the asshole then. Uh, but it looks gross. It does look gross. I'm not going to disagree with It really you. fucking ridiculous. <laughs> Reminded me of, uh, oh, my God, what was that? Uh, uh, Roger dip? Rabbit. Yep. The Roger Rabbit. Yeah, exactly oh, what you meant. Oh, Judge, oh, I uh, fucking hate it. Oh. Yep. oh, my God. Uh, fucking night. Well, let's move on to some great Nightwing number 112. From DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, Michael W. Conrad, art by Sammy Bosri, Francesco Francavia. In this issue, Nightwing is still having trouble jumping, but he is teaming up with Batman, a character you may be familiar with, as they track down a missing kid who has been taken by his you, uncle, I want to say. Did you cry, man? No. You didn't cry when you read I this? I did not cry. You're fucking dead inside, bro. You need to talk some to somebody. <laughs> That's well, fucking talk ridiculous. Talk about why you cried, then, Pete. This was a very touching story about like Nightwing and Batman, and then Nightwing trying to help this kid in a way that Batman helped him, and ah, oh, just oh, <laughs> I get you the goddamn feels, man. And you read this, and you're like, hey, I don't know, I don't fucking feel anything. So we had 37 uh, comics to read this week, Pete. I, I need to go quick. Oh, really? Are you pointing that out to me? <laughs> Dick. Uh, yeah, give raises to everyone who works at fucking DC Comics. This book <laughs> is fucking unbelievable. This is so touching, so moving, so uh, just amazing art. It, uh, just, you got to fucking read this comic. I don't know what you're doing out there, what you're doing right now, but stop and go get this goddamn comic and goddamn read it. Do you know what? There's definitely some sort of heart surgeon out there who's playing our podcast while he does heart surgery. <laughs> All right.
Pete told me to stop. I'm hoping there's someone working out going, well, I got to stop. I, uh, you know, I wanted to continue my workout. but gonna, gonna go read Night Ring, eat a garbage plate. Hey, there you my go. whole day has changed. Dutch <laughs> duck, Dutch Dutch, what? What did I just say? <laughs> Dutch just... number two from Image Comics. Dutch <laughs> duck. <laughs> Dutch, look out. Duck. <laughs> Dutch number two, written by Joe Casey, art by Simon Gain. <laughs> Hey, can I get the uh, Dutch duck? <laughs> the duck? <laughs> it's the uh, it's it's the pieces of duck served on a windmill as you and you grab pieces off the windmill. Dutch number two from Image Comics, written by Joe Casey, art by Simone Gain, is continuing the revamp of this classic '90s character who is now older but still doing very much like Image Comics stuff. I I gotta admit I like the art in this book. It reminds me a little bit of like a Robert Kirkman book. Yeah, somewhat. like Brit. Remind me of Brit. Brit, exactly what it reminds me of. But I'm bummed out because Dutch Number Zero set up such a clear John Wick style premise, and that's not what we're getting here at not all. Not yet. Well, he's like going and doing like wet works, sure, young blood style stuff, and I don't know. I'm just not as into that as much. Well, you might know, take a turn. Anyways, this is awesome. I I I love the action. Um, cover kind of spoiled the robot snake monster a little bit, but it was still such a cool fight. Um, Dutch kind of relies a lot on his uh, cyborg arm, you know, maybe a little too much. But uh, this is an awesome story, awesome art. Love the main character. Um, yeah, I also thought that line where he's like, maybe war follows me. Uh, just, yeah, just m more of this, please. This is just kind of fun, kind of like, uh, you know, almost kind of like a Clint eastwood -y type character. Who's it, old it's, and... it's Cable, basically. It, like, if you like Cable, I think you'll probably like this book. Right? I'm sure. I don't know. It's a guy with a metal arm doing tech stuff. Yeah, he's not time traveling, though. That's true. He never says body slide for one. Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver number two from Marvel, written by Steve Orlando, art by Lorenzo hey, Tometa. In this issue, while Scarlet Witch is dealing with some stuff of her own, specifically the wizard and a bunch of his henchmen, Quicksilver is running around the earth dealing with kind of the same thing from another direction, leading to a big, not too surprising cameo at the end. Continue to love the series. Steve Orlando just really gets these characters and their history really well. And Lorenzo Tometa's art is just stunning throughout. Great comic book. Yeah, hundred percent agreed. Yeah, and uh, Steve really uh, gets Darcy. You know what I mean? Like, does a great job of writing Darcy. The so it's main, always... the title character, Darcy. I, you know, I think we should change the title personally mm -hmm. uh, to Darcy and Friends. Uh, but yeah, I just think that. Um, you know, there's fun quips in here. There's a great mix of humor and action. And then kind of the reveal at the end is fun. I, I think this continues to be a blast. Um, yeah, I mean, this team is just absolutely killing it. Beneath the trees, ah! where nobody sees ah! number four from IDW by Patrick Corveth. We had Patrick on the live oh, show we this past week. Talk we talked to him about this book. We should have talked to him. This issue, we talked to him. We talked about the whole series, the covers, everything. Great interview. Great guy. Him. You definitely yelled at him. <laughs> God damn, I love this issue. I love this comic book so much. So really? we got a big cliffhanger at the end of the last issue where our main bear character, who is a serial killer, thinks she figured out who is the person who is killing people in her small town and drawing attention. Spoilers here. But, yep, not only was she right, but we get a war of the serial killers in this issue that is, I think, the tensest book that I read this week, for sure, and maybe this month. Oh, my God. By the end of the issue, our main character is sweating, and I was sweating, yes! too. 
This is great. This is like one of my favorite series in a very long time. I'm so scared going into the final two issues and I love it. Oh my God. Yeah. This is just what, what's frustrating is like a horror movie. I found myself yelling at the comic. Mm -hmm. So our kind of main character is the main serial killer and then turns out there's someone who's been watching and following the main serial killer. And, uh, you know, sorry for the spoilers here that I'm doing. Then the main serial killer turns around and yells at the fucking other serial killer. Like, that's something you should fucking do. Are you out of your mind? They just told you they're, they, like, are... You are their kind of morning star. You're their like shining light. They're like, oh, I followed you. I'm a huge fan of your work. And then you're going to yell at them. You know, they're going to turn on you. You should be like, oh, yeah, play along because they're a fucking psychopath. Uh, just so upsetting the decision she makes in this and then the ramifications and then the fact that you're working in your goddamn hardware store and one of your fucking employees finds one of your blood fucking paint jars and then you're not going to check all the others if one's there hey numb nuts that means there's going to be more like what are you fucking doing it's not just one how great is it though that Patrick has gotten you, the reader, in a place where you're like, no, yeah, clearly a horrible serial killer. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you identify and feel for this person who is should go to jail. This bear who should go to jail for the rest of her life, maybe be put to the electric chair. That you're like, oh my god, oh don't do that. No, that's terrible is incredible like that you could be that emotionally involved with this character who is reprehensible in a way that like they got away from very quickly for example in dexter the series and made him like i'm a heroic serial killer that's not what she is she's like straight up a unrepented serial killer fantastic book so good and the art is gorgeous throughout like absolutely beautiful and that's just... what makes it work this comic has fucked me up so hard. I went into Home Depot. I get to the paint section. I'm looking at everybody funny. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm like, why are you working in this section, bro? Like, what? what is it about the paint cans that really draws you in here? Like, uh, I am. This book has changed me. <laughs> it's. It's. Uh, I. I'm so into it, but I don't want to be. But man, I. It, yeah, I'm living every goddamn page of this, and it, it is a hell of a ride. More like beneath the peats where nobody eeks. <laughs> what? I don't know. I'll work on that. Superman number 12 from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by David Baldion and Norm Rapmund. In this issue, we are getting a finale to the attack of the Lex Luthor Revenge Squad. Back in the day, Lex Luthor was a hero. Superman knows that and is trying to turn the tide against these re-emergent villains. I will say, I feel like this wrapped up relatively quickly despite the fact that it's been going on for 12 issues but at the same time it leaves a lot of room for expanding on this in the future i think joshua williamson will so far really good run on superman i like the dynamic between superman and lex i'm enjoying this yeah as the josh williamson had here um i just feel like you know great kind of fun reveal of what's to come here you know spoilers but the house of brainiac cool great this sounds you love awesome. houses yeah um <laughs> don't they, get me they started. paint houses of brainiac don't they oh boy um yeah i i think that this is kind of like a cool art style i mean superman's a little bit more cartoonish in this but it's 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 a cool kind of look uh fun for this um any more lies, Lex? No. Uh, so, yeah, I just uh, there's some great lines of dialogue in here. This is very cool. Kill Your Darlings, number seven from Image Comics. Or don't. Ethan Love S. Love your Park. darlings. 
Parker and Griffin Sheridan, art by Robert Quinn. We had the whole team on our live show a couple of weeks back and talked to them about Did we? this comic. I, Did honestly, we, though? I don't know. I know we talked about issue number six. I don't know if we talked about issue number seven. Yeah. Regardless, it's all going down here as we rock it towards the finale as our main character figures out her power, figures out what she has over this mystical world and takes it directly to the witch who is coming for her and trying to corrupt everything that she stands for. Some big action in this issue, big emotional moments. What did you think, Pete? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I love that. There's some great lines. Tomorrow we bring the fight to them. You know, this is just uh, awesome stuff between the witch and these stuffed animals here. Um, yeah, that's th cute. It's gross. It has a ton of action plus magic. I'm enjoying this. Uh, the next issue should be really crazy. I think this is a blast. This has been building really nicely as well in terms of the scale. I've been very impressed with that. Speaking of scale, Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, number 13 Ooh. from Boob Studios, written by Jason Aaron, art by Nick Dragoda. Mezco and... Wait, I wanted to say Mezco and Mezzi. That's not what their names are. Whatever it is, this couple that is the center of this book are old now and trekking across the wasteland, reeking, connecting with each other. I am so invested in their relationship, possibly more in this relationship than the relationship I personally have with my wife, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, this is so sad, and it's headed for absolute gut-wrenching disaster, I think, by the end here. Lovely book. Love the Dick Trigoda art. Jason Aaron is just digging into what the entire arc of relationships are about. Big ideas. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Yeah, I was trying. I was flipping through the comic, trying to find the names. Um, uh, I just, you know, mother is what they call her. Um, anyways, this is such a amazing emotional roller coaster about uh relationships in such an interesting way you go from like not wanting them to work it out and then this issue a kind of twist happens where you're really pulling for them to work it out where before you're like they're not meant for each other this is a wreck i can't believe the things that they've done uh but man uh they really win you over in this issue give you hope this is such a amazing post-apocalyptic world that the artist has created these two characters have been through so much together it's just uh, just, uh, I mean, there's these, these small, amazing little moments, like when it's just pouring rain, and then one of them's like, oh, I'll find another cave, and they're like, no, you can join me here. It's just, oh, oh just awesome. The whole idea of a relationship past its end point, reconnecting yeah. with that person, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. I've occasionally been in that situation, and it's just, this perfectly channels that feeling there yes maceo and mezzi those are the names ah. of the characters midlife number six from image comics written by brian Mitchell, art by stefano Simeon. is the final issue of the series at least for now about a character who has the power to control and repel fire among other things we're getting a lot of big mythology stuff Overall, I would say I really like this series. I thought Stefano Simeone's art was really good. The design of the main character was really good. I think it got a little complicated because I loved the family drama, which is what we ended with here in this book. Oh, there's like family bit, drama, all right. Which I thought was really good. The mythology was the thing I was not quite as into. That got a little complicated and dense. But all the other stuff that paid off on the promise of... I'm a middle-aged superhero who suddenly has powers. What do I do with that? And how does that affect my family? I thought was very well done. Yeah, well, what would you think about the uh, parents uh, putting that kid in that, like, Sophie's Choice? Oh, my God. Like, hey, kid, who's the better storyteller? Your mother or me, your father? I was just like, oh, what are you doing to this poor kid? How is he supposed to choose who's the better parent here? This is just heartbreaking to watch. I'm sure you, you do this to your children nightly, just kind of... Uh... I was going to joke about it, but yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, Almost constantly. Yeah. Hello, daughter. Uh, who's the better parent? Right now, just stop. You well, go. You don't ask better parent, but definitely like who's better at this thing. And oh, they usually wow. have a good answer. Oh, yeah. That's fun. Mm -hmm. They make them, you make them, oh, that's just the sweating in that moment. I was really feeling, I was just like, this is too much. Mean, poor kid. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is a really great story. Uh, I really enjoy this comic, the world that it's uh, created in here. It uh, continues to be good. I'm sorry to hear that it's ending. Vengeance of the Moon Knight, number three from Marvel, written by Jed McKay, art by Alessandro Capuccio. We have been focusing on individual characters for the Midnight Mission as they deal with the ramifications of the death and potential return of Moon Knight. Here we're getting one of the vampire characters is revealing more about what is going on with all of this. Um, this... I like this issue. I like the art here. Like the Art's great. First two issues I thought were stronger, frankly, mm. but I'm... You didn't like the therapy break that we took in this issue where someone's just kind of talking it I out with like the therapist? I like that framing device. We've okay. had that in all okay. three issues where we've had a therapist talking to these individual characters. I think mm -hmm. that's very smartly done, particularly for somebody who is not 100% familiar with the members of the Midnight Mission. It's getting me up to speed on them really quickly. And Plus, if... If you haven't gone to therapy in a while, this is just a you can just jump right back in. You know what I totally. mean? It's just like I don't even pay stuff. for therapy at this point. I just, I just read, read comics. Yeah. yeah, and I'm fine. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to reiterate uh, that. I'm, I'm doing great. <laughs> You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very well adjusted. Yeah, this is weird a little bit. I mean, I love all the action. There's great fights. There's awesome art. Uh, the therapy is an interesting kind of framing device for all of this, but it is a little confusing of who's who, what's what, and what the fuck's happening. Other than that, I'm having a great time, and I do think the art is fantastic. I do really like where this ends up. I'm very excited for the next issue yes. of this title because there's a great cliffhanger here that leads us into, I think, getting past this framing device, so maybe you'll like that a little better, Pete. The Bloody Dozen, A Tale of the Shrouded College, number four from Image Comics, written by Charles Soule, art by Alberto and Menes Albuquerque. This is about a jailbreak. The Kirky. Bunch, different Kirky, of a bunch of vampires who are imprisoned near the sun. We have three astronauts who are taking them back, and in this issue, they are attacked by another faction. What are you thinking, Pete? Well, I'm thinking that this is, you know, uh, telling some bloody tales and then listening to people hash out their shit uh, as a giant battle breaks out. This is uh, very, I mean, you got a great team on this. If the soul is there, I'm there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If the soul is there, it's like the soul of Pixar, the movie. And that is the thing that I'm I thought you about. were going to say, if the soul is there, it's like a solar flare. And, Ooh, that's pretty uh, good. Yeah, I should I have know. said that. Yeah, we'll delete yeah, that part. That. We'll yeah. delete that part. And, we'll and the editing we do on these podcasts, oh is, God, it's God. a lot. <laughs> Chef's kiss. <laughs> uh, I like this book. This is going in directions that I 100% did not expect. I thought it would be a more over-the-plate jailbreak type thing, but... The so kind cool. Yeah, they kind of got past that pretty quickly and threw in a bunch of twists and turns. This does get to a very intriguing place by the end of the issue, where I'm really curious to check out issue number five. But overall, I think this is a very fun series. The Shrouded College is an interesting universe. I'm curious to check out what happens next yeah. titans number nine from dc comics written by tom taylor art by lucas meyer the big one of the big cliffhangers at the end of beast world was that raven has been taken over by her evil demonic opposite and she is working with her father trigon to free him from his eternal prison oh, and bring hell trigon. on earth we get some big movement here tell you what this storyline is going way faster than I expected. <laughs> yep. And I kind of appreciate that. Like, yeah. I like the fact that we're not being like, 
ooh, Raven's Evil, what's going to happen? Let's drag that out for six issues. It's like, nope, it's all going down. <laughs> it's about to happen. Oh, Here we it's go. all going down. Yeah, we got uh, some uh, cool uh, uh, covers, and then you got uh, Waller teaming up with the old Trigon Devil, and, uh, you know, uh, then you have Peacemaker walking in on Trigon. That was a little awkward and funny. Very funny moment with yeah. the Peacemaker. What do you think about Amanda Waller teaming up with Tricon because I still get like my spidey sense is going whenever we see Amanda Waller popping up where I'm like something is wrong with this this is not just what how do you get to a place where like Amanda Waller is the most powerful figure in the DC universe she's manipulating everything where does that end up with her in the middle of a battlefield being like bruised and beaten where Superman's like, well, I beat the shit out of you, Amanda Waller, and now you're done. There's got to be something else going on. No, I think what what you're missing is the fact that, uh, I, you know, Waller is, 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 you know, smart and evil strategically and then you put the you know the devil powers in there i'm waiting for the big reveal if you see waller with the six glowing eyes you know what i mean mm. like she's like oh yeah uh, there, there's something i think i want to go back maybe i missed something and maybe one of our listeners could let us know but they keep referencing something happened on earth three with amanda waller and i feel like something happened there that we don't know about yet and there's some twist to come yeah i'm sure there is uh but yeah i'm excited to see what's Very what's impressive. gonna happen uh in this comic so i i, I continue to enjoy this We'll see what happens, I guess. I don't know. I'm more interested in speculating clearly than you are. Why don't we move on with the Holy Roller number five from Image Comics, written by Rick Remender, Andy Sandberg. Ooh, don't stretch it out. Stretch yeah, it stop. out. No. Stretch it stop. out. Longer? More? This is non-verbal, you asshole. I love this. I love this. Stretch it out, you, says Pete. You're too much of a fucking veteran to not know these non-audio cues you fucking you dick. gotta stretch it out we need more time on this podcast all right so speed we got Wait, holy hold on roller, joe right? troman art by roland bosky go ahead okay Pete. thank you uh yeah i mean you know smoking come up with a plan playing mario kart what's better than that i mean this uh <laughs> you know this comic takes a weird hitler turn but up until then i was having a great time is this the first time you've seen yourself represented in a comic book? And by the way, I mean nope. hollow Hitler, not smoking up and doing Mario Kart. Well, uh, fuck you, I guess, is my response to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, this goes pretty hard in this issue. It goes in some crazy directions. Goes hard it for Hitler. Goes hard for Hitler. Uh, not great, but I don't know. There's a lot of ultra violence going on here. This is very goofy. This feels like... Very bad magazine down to the art Ooh. style. I yeah. don't have a problem with it, but this is like maybe not my favorite Rick Remender book. It's oh. it's very silly. I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Remender is uh, kind of magical where you think like, oh, I like this, but it's not my favorite. And then he kind of he slowly pulls you in. We'll see. I... I need to get emotionally involved here, and I'm not quite there yet, but overall... They had quality. me at Mario Kart. There you go. They had me at Hitler. <laughs> Lotus <laughs> Land, number five, from Boom feel? Studios, written by... That felt bad to say out loud. Written by Darcy Van Polgeest, art by Caio Felipe. We've been following this big hulking detective who's been trying to solve a mystery of uh, a bunch of stuff. To be honest, I don't 100% know what it is, but... At the same time, that's kind of the point, because a lot of what we're playing here is memory. We have a son who may or may not be real. His mother, who may or may not be the son's mother, is reconnecting with him. Per the title, it's all about, like, the lotus eaters. It's forgetting stuff, remembering stuff. How does our memory play tricks on each, uh, ourselves? A lot of it is probably going to come out of the last issue, but I really like the art in this book, and I like the writing. Even though I'm not 100% sure what's going on, I think that's kind of the point, and I'm very intrigued. Yeah. 
I agree, 100%. Yeah, uh, very interesting comic. You know, we get some bird watching going on here. Kid talking about his hands a lot, you know, in this post-apocalyptic world. But, uh, yeah, the writing and the art's intriguing enough that I'm going to keep checking it out. And last but not least, something epic. Number eight from Image Comics by Simon Kondransky. This is a continuation of the series. Very surprised to see it, but about a bunch of folks called epics who can channel imagination and characters into the real world and create stories. Here we're following a mystery where, spoiler, but Sherlock Holmes gets murdered. What? And an epic gets recruited by not Howard the Duck to solve it's it. It's Howard the Duck. It is Howard the Duck, but they don't call him Howard the Duck. It's Howard the fucking I Duck. I really... Looks I mean, like I a love, duck. Talks like Howard the Duck. It's Howard the fucking Duck, man. Really like Simon Kudratsky's art. It's very detailed. It's very specific. Very good. Even when he has packed dialogue panels, the art still really sings throughout, which is very impressive and hard to do. I wasn't sure about continuing this series because it already felt like it went past the point where it needed to in the first arc, but I was very into this kickoff. I think this is a really nice extension of this concept. I was very impressed. We're getting a different main character than the first seven issues here. I like this quite a bit. What about you, Pete? Yeah, there's a lot going on. I'm not sure I'm uh, abreast of everything that's happening, but... Uh... Yeah, you know, the Howard the Duck stuff is fun, and uh, the art's epic, and just like the title, and I gotta stop saying the word epic, but uh, yeah, I think we did a great job on the stack. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to support the show, which we did an amazing job with, and all the shows we do, <laughs> patreon.com slash comic book club. Oh, also, boy. we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Justin, Facebook we miss you, buddy. <laughs> Uh, no, this show would have been three times as long if Justin was here. Facebook and YouTube to come hang out and talk about comic books at Comic Book Live on Twitter slash X, Comic Book Club Live on TikTok and Instagram, ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the Comic Book Club. Yeah. Hey.